Welcome to Exagility. I'm your host, John Coleman. So, Tom, I wanted to talk to you about impact estimation tables in the success book. I found it really interesting. I've never actually seen any articulation like this before where people would look at estimates and the uncertainty around those and also maybe the credibility as well in reference to the source. And I wonder if you could explain to the audience impact estimation tables are. And so the first thing is to give people the explicit recognition that there are multiple factors simultaneously. There's not just one quality thing. There's not just one cost thing. Okay. There's not just one architecture thing. There are, in fact, multiples, order of magnitude, first iteration, top 10 of each top 10 values or qualities, top five maybe of the costs in practice, and top 10 strategies. And these can be further decomposed as needed, depending on the size of your system. That's the first thing to just say, let's recognize that we can't oversimplify by just having a few factors we loosely call quality and cost. Our reality, even for fairly simple systems, is that these are 10 different but critical values. They have different names, different definitions, different measurements. They're just not quality or or even value or anything like that. Now, and you can do a very, very simple impact estimation table without a lot of fuss by putting a little question mark or a blank if you don't know how the strategy or architecture relates to the value. Okay, so here here's the intersection between a strategy, which is also known as a design and architecture, a solution. They're all the same thing. They're the concrete technical stuff we're going to do and spend money on so that we achieve all of these values. Okay. Now, what one solution does not give all the values. So you're going to need a few other solutions until you've got enough solutions to deliver your values. You can do this incrementally and a little bit at a time. You certainly don't have to do it all at once or anything like that. Now, again, you can do it simple. You can put a little plus in there if you believe there is a positive effect. And you could put a minus if you believe there is a negative side effect, okay? If you get yeah. too much yeah. security, people might feel that usability is threatened, okay? Now, simple symbols to indicate the relationships is forcing yourself to think about what you know and what other people know and provides a discussion platform. Have we got the right strategies? By the way, the strategies carry the costs. So once you've got a set of strategies you think will work, then, you know, it's it's time to estimate the capital cost, the annual cost, the effect on technical debt and things like that, and sum it all up. And before you know it, you have a set of values over a set of costs, which I call effectiveness over cost, cost effectiveness. Another word for that is efficiency. Another word for that is sort of profitability okay and the higher the value to cost ratio the better priority we should give that particular thing and the earlier we ought to do it and deliver it incrementally without waiting to see what happens with the other stuff now i didn't quite discuss the numbers and the risk things yet but i sense that you wanted to ask me something yeah, I want to go, go there it? because I get the whole idea about value divided by effort or cost, but you seem yeah. to be kind of digging further about uncertainty as well, for example. Absolutely. Well, again, depending on the nature of your project, I mean, if you're doing the national health system, I'd certainly go a lot further. So it's up to you. But what we do is we, for every one of these ratings, scorings, call them what you like about how good the strategy is for helping you deliver 
enhanced or improved value or quality, we ask a very simple question. Thanks for your opinion that it gets us halfway to the goal, but how do you know that? Meaning, what is your evidence? A standard question. And by the way, where did you get your evidence? Can we examine, review, analyze your evidence and find out how good it is? In other words, it's credibility. Because, you know, you can have good evidence from a bad source and you can have bad evidence from a good source. And what you'd like is pretty good evidence from a pretty good source. And so what I do is I rate the evidence and the source of the evidence on a scale of zero, no credibility, and 1.0. Let's call it 100% credibility. You better believe it. It's rock solid guarantee this will happen. Okay. In addition... I ask another question when people make an estimate of, say, 50%. I say, fine, but could it be a little bit lower in practice? Yeah, always. Could it be a little bit higher? Uh, Could be. Okay, I want you to translate that to a plus minus. Is it plus minus 1, 5, 10, 40, 55? Okay, whatever that means. In other words, what kind of range are we looking for? What is the uncertainty? What is the spread of results? And I then, long story short, use these risk evaluations, that is the risk of these numbers not being good ones, and I use them to modify my conclusions. And I can say, well, I'm feeling lucky today, punk, so I'll just take, I won't look at the risk things, and I'll take that one because it's green. But if you say, I'm very anti-risk, we can't afford to fail on this like we did on the last national health system. So we're going to be very conservative Mm -hmm. and we're going to take the one that's guaranteed to work within narrow range. You know, that won't always be true, but it'll be truer than if you just dive in and hope for the best. There's an important point here because we're talking about estimating in the first instance. But when we are delivering things incrementally, and I'm delivering all systems in one or two percent increments from very early stages, there's no other interesting way to work as far as I'm concerned. We get the opportunity to measure what happened. Okay. And in particular, what happened compared to what we thought would happen. If we thought we're going to get a five percent increment and we got zero time to analyze our misunderstanding at an early stage and do something with it. If we thought it was going to cost 1% of capital cost and it cost 10% of capital cost, time to analyze this and maybe redesign to something cheaper, get rid of that problem at an early stage. So long story short, these estimates are just a first, let's call it first draft, so that we can start in a healthy way with probably very high value, probably very low cost probably very low risk things. So we're in a very good starting position, but then we assume that Murphy's law will kick in. If anything can happen, it will at the wrong time and place and everything like that. Yeah. So what we do is we ally ourselves with numeric feedback and we analyze that feedback and decide to do smart things with it before we push on with wrong ideas, wrong estimates, wrong assumptions. So this is, in other words, estimate and then deliver incrementally with corrections is what's going on here. A lot of people misunderstand this as we're just estimating and we're coming out with some final truth. Well, that's not agile, number one. You know, we are very agile here yeah. in the sense of de- delivering small increments, but we choose those increments based on their potential power, their value and cost and risk. And then we recognize we can be wrong. And we adjust those by redesign and other things so that hopefully the increments continue in better shape. Yeah. Thank you, Tom. It looks very sensible, actually. Uh, I think it should be used much more often. Maybe it needs a little bit of re-energizing or something Uh, by uh, other people as well so that they're aware that this is something you should really give a go. I agree. But, Um, for example, which professors know this and teach it? And the answer is practically none. They teach inferior methods. I could name the inferior methods, but won't. In fact, one of them is very, very famous. It's Balanced Scorecard, which tries to do something similar, but it doesn't have the discipline of quantifying the values, 
quantifying multiple costs. The whole thing here is much more disciplined and therefore more realistic. Okay. So where the professors are yeah, teaching also, the wrong things. And balanced scorecard as well lacks focus, in my opinion. It's like we're trying to do everything and run down the hill. It, it is just too much. Whereas yeah. impact estimation table is about, okay, what are we trying to do here? Yeah. Yeah. Well, you see, balanced scorecard, so cool. now that came out of, that came out of Harvard. Therefore, it must be good. And I've, <laughs> I've, uh, I, I, I've got a lot of documentation of what's wrong with balanced scorecard. Yeah, I can tell you the next time I'm teaching MBA students, I'll be teaching them impact estimation tables to the best of my ability. Good for Tom, you. I'll and and teach them the comparison. <laughs> I mean, I've written a lot about comparisons yeah. to similar methods. There's even a Middlesex University doctoral degree on the subject, which I can supply you with if you want some good academic ammunition by Lindsay Brody. Oh, thank you so much. Looking forward to that. It's important not yeah, well, to teach the evidence. Uh, yeah. This, yeah. this is the right method. You know, we have the truth. But here's how you compare these things. And here's why one method is, in fact, more useful for you than others. So on page 45, the laws of project success, there's actually two things that really struck me about this page. First of all, I'll read out Gilb's laws of project success. So number one, if you have not defined success clearly, then it is possible to reach it. That makes a lot of sense, <laughs> but a lot of people don't do it. <laughs> and then mm -hmm. conscious design beats random conventional construction when the success requirements are ambitious and the systems are complex and dynamic. If potential problems are solved or prevented early, then that is far more cost effective than reacting to failure threats much later. That uh, also reflects what was said in I hope big things get done, that book as well. Ideal requirement levels require infinite resources. Indeed. Balancing conflict uh, by, requirements. By, by, will be by, by, by the way, I was working at uh, International Computers Limited, and the quality director, John, said to me, Tom, we should have as a corporate standard 100% availability of the systems. And I said, John, that will put you out of business if you took it seriously. Let's ask how much availability yeah. you have now. The answer was something like 90% at the time and set a level, let's say 99% as a corporate standard, which is within reason. And it has to be competitive also. In other words, you can't price yourself out of the market by having too good a quality. Indeed. And then it says, balancing conflicting requirements will be more successful than disappointing multiple unreasonable target expectations. <laughs> uh, yeah, don't yeah. don't deal with extremists. Everybody be nice to everybody. Yeah. Cooperate. Give a little, take a little. Yeah. And then a disciplined engineering approach is the most cost-effective method for reaching success and keeping it. And scientific methods also apply to industrial and public service projects. So right. I really loved now, these laws of project success. On the disciplined engineering, long, long after I wrote that, the book that you and I have read, How to Manage uh, Big Things, by Bent Flüvbjerg and one other co-author, in a sense, they proved that with statistics from 16,000 projects. A disciplined engineering approach is the most cost-effective method for reaching success and keeping it. So if you want some proof, read the book or look at the 16,000 project database, of which only 0.5% of the projects managed to be totally successful. But they did it, he, he says in the book, clear as a bell, disciplined engineering approach. Yeah, combination of experience and experimentation as well to make yep, mistakes yep. while it was, while it was cost effective to make the mistakes. Yep. Yeah. Yeah. And what I loved on this page as well, Tom, is you said there's Gary Loper's laws, I think. You said they're maybe not scientific, but I'm just going to read them, just the headlines, if that's okay. Yeah. The five laws of strato, strato, was it stratospheric success? <laughs> hmm. The law of value, your true worth is determined by how much more you give in value than you take in payment. Hooray! The law of compensation, like your, income is <laughs> your income is determined by how many people you serve and how well you serve them. Mm -hmm. The law of influence, your influence is determined by how abundantly you place other people's interests first. I really like that. Wonderful. And then the law of authenticity. Yeah, the most valuable gift you have to offer is yourself. And the law of receptivity, the key to effective giving is to stay open to receiving. Ooh. What made you put that one 
to the page, Tom, like alongside your laws of success. I love them, but I'm curious why you, why you uh, brought these in. Well, Gary's laws, I, I bumped into somewhere and I, I forget if I'd, I'd have to look it up, put it that way. But my own laws, what I do is I literally sit down and say, okay, I'm going to focus on the laws of success. And I write one after the other and edit them until I'm happy. And that's how they're arrived at. I ask a very simple question. Do they seem critical to learn and do? And do I know that they work in practice like every time, according to you know my experience since 1960, all over the world? And if they meet those criteria, they're good enough for me. And if I move on to principles on page 46, right. just read these to the audience. It says, we will always tell our client the full truth in writing. In writing. We will always offer to do things in the client's real long-term best interests, explaining why and in spite of their instructions to the contrary. Yeah. <laughs> if a client insists on acting or instructing us in a manner that will probably lead to failure or serious lack of success, then we will regretfully resign from the assignment, giving our reasons in writing. Mm -hmm. I really like that one as well. I've done that a couple of times, actually. Yeah. Yeah. So uh, sometimes well, you don't want your own reputation you help, besmirched right? by a failure because they'll try to pin it on you. You better pull out while you're supposed oh, yeah, to have a time. chance to keep your reputation alive. Mm. Uh, by the way, many examples of this, but for example, in the book on big projects, Frank Gehry, the architect, was given as a good example of exactly this. And he's very successful. And he delivers everything on time and under budget with remarkable value. I'd like to talk to you next, Tom, about eliciting stakeholder critical requirements on page 53. And I'm really curious about this because I get it. It's coming across really strongly in your book that you need to engage with your stakeholders. You need to be thorough in your analysis of stakeholders. You need to understand which stakeholders you need to worry about more and all that kind of stuff. And the world is in sheep's clothing. You don't say that, but that's what I'd be worried about as well. But have you any tips and tricks for how you can elicit the critical requirements of stakeholders. Because in my experience, a lot of the time, particularly when I'm going about agility, for example, I go into a client and they say they want to do blah, 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 right? But actually what they want to do mm -hmm. is they want to fire a thousand people. You know what I mean? But they won't, they're mm -hmm. not honest sure. with me about it. They tell me they want to do something sure. else. And of course, I'll that give causes you my misalignment tip. then, of course. Yeah, I'll give you my so. tip. When you sense yeah? they are not really asking for what they, is really critical, what they really want. Your question politely is, why do you want that? Explain to me in some detail. Uh, meaning, what do you think you're going to get out of it at the end of the day? Okay. Now, the moment they start articulating that, they will be articulating a higher level of real concern that they have not articulated because they like Take it for granted. You know, we've got to earn money. we got to get market share. We've got to have high quality products. But then what you do when they give you their reason, their, their why reason, you give them then what I call the mafia offer. Mm -hmm. Do you want that thing you asked me for? Let's call it X. Even if you do not achieve your why objectives. Or do you want to achieve your why objectives? even if you never get what you asked me for. It's called a mafia offer, your money or your life. They've got to answer that they want the highly critical value stuff. And they do every time. They just are not conscious of this simple line of reasoning. But consultants can help them. And there may be more than one level upwards as you move through a large organization. Okay, but why gets you going up the value chain, okay? And now, let's just say they have something like uh, security. You know, wh why did you want this uh, Microsoft security services? Well, for security, of course, good. How much security do you want and when? Now, they will not have done anything about that. You know, they say buy Microsoft packages or whoever and everything will be great. Microsoft makes no promises whatsoever. I've documented this in detail in 
slides I can show you. And nobody does. So you say, look, shouldn't we decide if we want 95% chance of detecting hackers within five seconds or today only 50%? And if we really want something more like 95%, don't we have to start there and say, that's what we really want. And if Microsoft can give it to us, guarantee it, put their money where their mouth is, no cure, no pay, well, we'd be delighted to give them a contract to do so. But if they shy away and say, well, well, mm, it's kind of difficult, everything's very complex and changing all the time, and blah, 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 please buy our system and don't ask nasty questions like that, then you should shy away from them as a supplier. They are not competent. They're not working in your interest. They're not interested in your interest. Big surprise. Okay. You've got to find someone, hopefully yourself, as in the book, The Big Con. You know, stop outsourcing everything to people who steal your corporate knowledge. And you work out internally what you need to do for your security with your people largely. Okay. And then you incrementally prove that you are incrementally moving towards those value, numeric value objectives that you've set, you know, you're at 60% today, but in a few months or a few years, you're at 90%, etc. You know that the thing is happening that you want it to happen, which is a higher degree of security. Thank you, Tom. And if I move on to page 60, stakeholder principles, I'm going to read them out, actually, if you don't mind. I've got a headline there. It says, um, chaotic stakeholders are normal. And you've got that kind of really highlighted in red and white text. And, and then you've got the principles underneath, so I'll read them. Some stakeholders are more critical to your system than others. Yeah. Some stakeholder needs are more critical to your system than others. Okay. Stakeholders are undisciplined. They may not know all their needs or know them precisely or know their value, but they can be analyzed, coached, and helped to get the best possible deal. That's kind of what you were advising me earlier, right? Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. And then stakeholders may be inaccessible, unwilling, inanimate, oppositional, and worse, but we need to be able to deal with them intelligently. Yes, I have experienced that myself several times. <laughs> stakeholders might well ask for the wrong thing. <laughs> kind of what you mentioned earlier, actually. So stakeholders mm. might well ask for the wrong thing, a means rather than you know, that. That's what you mentioned a while ago, yeah. Stakeholders do not want to wait for years, get delays, invest shitloads of money, and then get little or no value. They want as much value improvement of the current situation as they can get, as fast as they can get it, for as little cost as possible. A lot of people forget that. And stakeholders cannot have any realistic idea of what their needs and demands will cost to satisfy, so their adopted by you requirements need to be based on value for cost, not on value alone. Yeah, that's where you're kind of talking about effectiveness of cost, right? Efficiency. Mm -hmm. And delivering small increments based on high value to cost is one smart way to deal with this. If you think you've found all the critical stakeholders, I think you should assume there is at least one more. And when you find that one, dot, 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 in other words, there's probably more, new stakeholders will emerge and they're not all identified at the beginning. Yeah, I know a guy who was burnt like that, actually, very badly. If you think you have found all critical needs of a stakeholder, there will always be at least one more thing hiding. <laughs> it's kind of like Murphy's Law on steroids, isn't it, Tom? Yeah, Tom? yeah. <laughs> or Mickey um, Mouse the Apprentice. Yeah. Mickey Mouse the Apprentice in Fantasia. Yeah, yeah. It's my image. Yeah. If you do not understand and act on the principles above, you might blame your failure on system complexity and the unexpected and wicked problems, but in reality, it is your own fault and responsibility Deal with it yeah. upfront and constantly thereafter. There you go. Yeah. <laughs> Happens, deal with it, as somebody said in a book recently. Yeah, exactly. That's exactly what I was going to say. Yeah. <laughs> this slide comes from a whole book called Stakeholder Engineering, which I have a digital copies of for free for your friends. Thank you very much, Tom. I'll make sure it's in the footnote of the podcast. You've been coaching me for a while now, and, and one of the things that I was really struck by was – how you quantify success and um i've been showing it to some colleagues as well you know the kind of some of the stuff that you helped me with and it's been that's kind of where we're going next so on page 63 deriving the scale from the ambition level so mm. could you give, give a little bit of background to the audience tom on how you go about quantifying expectations quantifying success using your approaches 
Okay. So I begin with the logical observation that if we're dealing with a variable, meaning we can say enhanced, improved, lowered, worse, then we can inherently quantify it. It's built in. It's guaranteed every time. No exception. People don't know that. And so we go looking, and there are lots of ways of going looking. Now, if we were looking for something as easy as speed of a car, and somebody said, right. I don't have to invent that. That's called miles per hour, or here on the continent, kilometers per hour, or in Star Trek, you know, warp speed, you know. Okay, so in many cases, the scales of measure are known. We must merely adopt them, okay? The things as simple as number of times a user clicks on buy, you know, not very complex scale of measure there, the, the kind of thing. Now, it turns out there's an awful lot of really critical things we're dealing with. I'm thinking of how to quantify the qualities of an AI system. Everybody's running around like scared chickens trying to yeah. figure out what the AI system threat is, is what security and transparency, and they do not quantify these items. I have several years ago quantified the items and shared it with people on the IEEE committees who agreed with me in principle we should do this, recommended that they do it, and haven't quite done it yet. These committees are painfully slow, okay? So long story short, people aren't used to the idea that you can quantify even though it's never been done before, any critical value or quality variable. And now there's a method, and I have several books on the method. One of them is called Quantier, free copy for your people, John. The Quantier is quite simply the step-by-step -step art of how you do this. It, it can be as simple as you have an insight, you're sort of used to it, you do it and it works. It can be very simple. But the problem is when people have something like security. I asked a group of 200 AI specialists about a month ago, how many of them had quantified security of the AI system? Not one raised their hand. So we're at a painfully embarrassing low level that we could have years ago transitioned from by making an intellectual decision to quantify the critical aspects of AI systems. Same applies to the security of systems, same problem. People are not used to doing it. So we have to make the decision. The literature is available free from me here, okay? And it's not like nobody in management, engineering, or science ever quantified anything and learned from it. That's pretty old hat. Let's just say that's a few thousand years old. Thank you, Egyptians. You know, so the fact that they're not doing it and using buzzwords, that's ridiculously immature. People who do that should be retrained or replaced. And I'm angry. Yeah, so, and I witnessed this myself when I was looking at, do you help me to kind of figure out how do you measure executive success through agility? And we were looking at things, for example, looking at the shareholder price increase, employee engagement, uh, maybe measured through glass door ratings and CEO ratings and stuff like that. And even psychological safety was something that you helped me to kind of break down in terms of psychological safety for who, in what way. And Everything. I published a book called Software Metrics in 1976, yeah. and it has hundreds of ideas and suggestions for doing this. So it's not that we don't know and haven't known, and it's not that nobody's done it. My best clients, my mature clients, example, Intel, Hewlett Packard, Boeing, etc. they do this because they are, in fact, engineering companies and they know they have to do it, okay? It's these people who are not engineers but somehow mucking about with IT systems and have no engineering qualifications, or if they have, they're not making use of the knowledge, that are the trouble, okay? What's happened yeah. is our systems yeah, yeah. have grown in complexity and difficulty to handle where engineering is necessary. That's a general truth of civilized growth, okay? And, you know, when you have a skyscraper yeah. instead of a hut, you need engineering. And we have not, we've talked software engineering for years, 
But you know what? That just means coding to some people. It has nothing to do with engineering at all. We're really not doing the engineering we need to do for systems of the complexity of, say, the national health system and the UK defense system and systems like that. We haven't woken up. Yeah. Somebody needs to wake us up. Indeed. If it was just to give an example from the executive success work that I'm doing, and it's only draft materials, it's not perfect or anything, but psychological safety defined as a percentage of the degree of acknowledgement of psychological safety by human entity as a result of a defined environment. And human entity is broken down to family, spouse, employee, executive manager, customer, parent, guardian, child, baby, disabled person, person from an underrepresented community, new employee, supplier, executive, supplier, manager, yeah. supplier, employee, supplier, contractor, contractor, consultant. And then the defined right. environment, home workplace, remote workplace, office workplace, internet or phone calls, off-site venue, supplier workplace, work event or workshop, conference, meet yeah. up. The point is, by making this written definition or structure, you can now model and master complex systems that's the thing and it's an engineering technique for modeling complex systems yeah and just, just to continue though tom if you don't mind i, I came up uh, with a few uh, sample measurements I, I, i'm going to read them out level of reprioritization in a data form manner in the direction of travel number of initiatives reported as being at risk and, and needing help number of ideas killed from discovery number of constructive critical comments on the intranet Shared profit for all employees, shared ownership by employees, countermeasures then as well, because every measure needs a countermeasure. Number of complaints from employees about behavior. Number of impediments closed that arose again. Bonus scheme for management only. And bonuses are tailored to the extent collaboration is secondary. So they, these were just sample measurements that I used uh, based on psychological safety. So basically, when you're doing measurement, it seems that you drive the scale, you look at the qualifiers, benchmarks, and you also set failure borders and success levels. Can you talk a little bit about that? Because I noticed that you, yeah. not only do you help people to come up with the clarity of measuring success, but also what does success look like and what does failure look like, I've noticed. You, you seem right. to do a lot of work on that. So once we have a scale of measure, let's take a simple car example. Is there a um, a slowest legal speed on a British road, like 10 miles an hour, British highway, five miles an hour before the police will pull you over and say, you're a danger to traffic. You're going too slow. Yeah. yeah. There is, yeah I'll drive slow enough and, and they'll get you. Okay. So, so that's an example of a constraint. So let's just say for the sake of argument on a major highway, it's 70 miles per hour. Just say. And what is the maximum speed on that same highway? Let's just say it's uh, 85 or 90. Okay. So these are two different ideas. You fail if you go too fast and you fail if you go too slow. Okay. That's number one. And you've defined this with numbers. Okay. It's like temperature. You fail if you're too hot to be comfortable and you fail if you're too cold. Okay. So it's very important to define these borders because Number one, you can test a system before paying for it that it works that way, test criteria. And number two, you can design an architect and get incremental feedback that it is in that direction. Things are working that way before you get a failure of handover or something like that. Now, what I found is that when people set goals, if they set numeric goals at all, many don't, they set one goal. You know, we want to get to 95% for security. But they don't ask the question, under certain circumstances, if we were to lower it to 90% for special cases, which are not very dangerous, could we save a whole lot of money? And if so, why don't yeah. we? That's what I call a, a value constraint or a scalar constraint. But it's a number on the scale that defines the point at which it's either the lowest acceptable point. We call that the tolerable level. Or you can just below that is what we call a failure level. But in other words, it's very important by defining failure levels, you're saying if you are better than this, you have not failed. But not failed just over the border is not the same as the success we think about. We think about success. That's usually a lot more than the absolute minimum for survival. 
Okay, so we have another number, which is a fatter, bigger number, which is where your dreams are fulfilled, everybody's terribly happy, and you're a hero, whatever that is. Let's call it huge profit. The kind of thing that Elon Musk has with his 19% profit while all others around him have four for delivering cars. <laughs> he probably, he's, he literally yeah, talks yeah. about get going to more than 19, 20% profit while the other guys have no idea how to get above 5%. My stock went up in Tesla today remarkably. <laughs> Someone I used to work with, he's a kind of a hobbyist uh, selling and buying shares and so on, but he gave up on Tesla because uh, every time Elon Musk says something, the share price goes up or down and he just couldn't deal with it. <laughs> couldn't deal with it. Yeah, 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 deal with yeah. If I move on to page 73, Tom, there's a quote you put in there from Schumacher. It says, small is beautiful. Yes, it is. Uh, I can relate to that expression because I, I'm doing a lot of work on something and people are trying to advise me, oh, wait, 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 you know, hold off. You need to do something it needs to be more polished and blah, 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 da, da, da. And yeah, there does need to, it does need to be a certain level of quality, but I'm kind of I'm saying I'm just going to release an alpha, an alpha version now, get some feedback and see what people say. And then I can do the polishing and the beta version. And then I'm a bit worried that I can kind of leave it go too long and I don't find out whether I'm on the right track or not. So. I can relate to small is beautiful. And you talk about small increments a lot during the book as well. Divide and conquer. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Now, this is a surprisingly large subject that I feel people do not understand. That is 99% have no idea what kind of decomposition I believe in and how to do it. They know how to decompose, you know, bill of materials of anything like the human body, you know, one hand yeah. and fingers. But the trick here, if you're doing agile, is to, at a very early stage, first month, decompose a very large problem, like the National Health Service new system, and start delivering yeah. enhancements that deliver value every month or every week, forever. Now, most people start off by saying, but Tom, you can't do that. It's too big, too complex. You, there's no way you can find such an increment. And we are the experts from the National Health Service, and you better listen to us because we are the experts. Now, every time I've had that discussion, and they've given me a fair chance, like today, this hour, to prove them wrong, they have agreed that they are proven wrong, that there are such decompositions where you can start your value stream. You can start delivering numerically measurable value enhancements to the national health system, to a given hospital and a given ward. And you can go from there and just keep on incrementally expanding everything until your you know, national health system is perfect if it ever gets there. So now what I've found is when I tell my students, decompose. This architecture, this big, this architecture you suggested will take two years to implement, right? And I said, decompose it. Mm -hmm. So they decompose it like a bill of materials thing, you know, like into a number of meetings and approvals and reviews and writing some code, you know, work processes. And I say, no, 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 no. Your decompositions must be able to be done within a week for sure and must reasonably try to deliver measurable value for our top 10 critical objectives of value. And you know what? Sometimes, if necessary, I give them an example. I look at their problem and show them how easy it is. But it's a same day thing, a same hour thing. They, almost all of them, and these are smart people, educated people, they get it wrong to begin with because they have a certain bad notion of decomposition, bad for agile anyway. Yeah. And when they get the right one, they're able to do it regularly in depth forever. It's just nobody ever taught them this simple idea of decomposition, that it has to be something you can do now and get results. Now, who is against getting results now? Who's against learning how to do yeah. that? Yeah, nobody. Mm. Yeah, I've I've seen that as well myself, Tom, where people break down outcomes into outputs, into activities. And before you know it, they're breaking down the two week chunks of just activities, you still get no value. I said to them, you know, can you give me some examples? And they might say, oh, here's 21 examples. I say, okay, can you just give me one? 
<laughs> no, we have to do them all. Well, maybe you do, maybe not. You just give me one example. And, so, and then they go off and do the example, you see. And then they find seven examples that weren't valid at all. They find four new ones. And they would never would have known if they didn't just start. You know what I mean? Not thinking mm-hmm. about outcomes. So I can completely relate to what you're saying there. Yeah, yeah. I see that a lot. Actually. Now, remember, these are the same um, people who have not defined and agreed their value criteria. So one of the ad- advices is, hey, focus on value X, which needs to go from 60% to 95 now, think of something, however small, that will move you 1% next week, but can be done next week. They literally have to focus on a value they have never defined clearly in their life and never learned to do it. So we have a structural problem here. People haven't even got a clear idea of the values they want. And therefore, they cannot decompose yeah. to deliver the value stream. Yeah. And look at a page 74 here as well. You've got play smart bets, gamble to win, which is kind of what you're talking about. But what's really capturing my attention is there's an image on it, which I'll describe to the listeners, where you've got this impact estimation table, which you talked about earlier, and you've got percentage of weight to goal and percentage of weight to budget. And I really like that you've been talking about the value and the budget in there, because a lot of people kind of get lost in the cost, don't they? That's very nice. Again, I emphasize this is agile as it should be. It is not agile as currently taught by almost everybody else. So finally, Tom, page 75 is the last page I'm going to talk about today. All right. And this is the one that it's a nice, it's a nice one to end up as well because it's got the value success principles and there's kind of big headline value engineering gives more value faster. And I'd like to read the principles, if you don't mind. And then I'd love to get your maybe summary as well, but I'll just read them for now. So here they are. Number one, focus. Keep your focus at all times on the values needed by critical stakeholders. That's kind of what you're talking about a while ago with the NHS. At all times. Number two, prioritize the values that give the biggest impacts on critical stakeholder environments. Number three, deliver. Prioritize delivery of the most cost-effective values first. Four, quantify. Make values quantified and measurable step-by-step. Five, learn. Everybody forgets the learn bit, don't they? Learn early Mm -hmm. how to scale up value spread to the larger environment. Number six, publicize. Publicize your real current measurable value delivery, at least internally, attract interest and support, and maybe even more budget, because, yeah, that might build head of steam, actually, to do more of this. Help quantify, number seven, help stakeholders express their value ideas, not their solution ideas, quantitatively. And eight, get costs, help stakeholders understand the total cost picture of the value levels they are asking for. So that's kind of what you're talking about a while ago, 100% uptime, that'll put you out of business. So what can you really afford kind of thing? Mm. And you kind of left it there on the 22nd of October, 2021. You said you want to write more at some point. Maybe you will, maybe you won't, but you've got loads of other books. And I'm looking forward to talking to you about maybe some other books on another show, Tom. I'd love to thank you so much for being on the show. But how would you summarize uh, the success book for the audience, Tom? What would you want people to take away from, from your book? Okay. Quantify success. Work incrementally towards it. Nice and simple. Well done. Tom, thank you very much for coming on the Exeterity Podcast. Absolute pleasure to have you on the show, and hopefully I'll have you on the show again soon. Thank you so much. A pleasure. Thank you.